This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Tech, show number 134, recorded on September 5th, 2013. Here at Home Tech, we cover all your favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the Average Guy TV studios here in Bellevue, Nebraska, and we post the show with world-class show notes each week and actually have been adding some things to the show notes. So if you haven't checked them out over the last two weeks, you can now go into the show notes and click the link to the exact spot in the YouTube video uh, for, for what we've talked about. So if you haven't checked those out, get out to the show notes, theaverageguy.tv. Like for this show, it'll be theaverageguy.tv slash HT for home tech, HT. 134, 133 for last week, 132. You, you get the pattern there, right? Uh, head out and check out those show notes. I've been put, putting a bunch of time into them lately, so appreciate you guys reading those. If you have questions, comments, or contributions, you can contact the show via email. Just send that to me, podcast at theaverageguy.tv. Of course, find me on Twitter at Jay Collison, or follow the show schedule over on our Twitter account, the Average Guy TV. If you, you can also join us live uh, for, for the show and for chat, over at theaverageguy.tv slash live when it works. It's having a little difficulty tonight, although it's working for Christian, not working for us. But typically you can head over there. We also have a high-def YouTube version. If you just look at the upper right-hand corner at theaverageguy.tv, you can click the link. And uh, when I get it right, you can watch this on YouTube live in a high-def version. Get a little bit, a little bit better video that way. You can watch it out there as well. All right, we've got a great show for you tonight. Christian's got a whole bunch of stuff to kind of update us on, so we're going to spend a little bit of time in an extended Christian's Corner, and uh, so we'll roll that out here in a second. A couple uh, housekeeping items just to get out of the way for you guys that are listening and come to the meetup. We, uh, Of course, we are finalizing the plans for the September 21st meetup in Indianapolis. Uh, most of you, a lot of you that listen to this are coming, um, and if you, it's still not too late. We've got a handful of slots that are still open. We haven't filled it all the way yet, but it is. we are still getting uh, folks that are signing up for it. So uh, Mike is all set. Mike Howard is all set to come as well. Mike, you getting geared up for the meetup? I am. I'm getting all geared up, ready to come. And uh, we're still trying to f figure out a way to get Christian there, but I just think it's going to be too much of a distraction for him. He's busy with his freshman year school. Christian, how's, how's school going? School is uh, amazing. It's exceeded my expectations so far in uh, many different ways. Um, and it's been an extremely hectic, busy, rushed um, week, but a lot of excitement. And uh, it's really fun to be out here. So Nice. All right, good stuff. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that here shortly, but uh, good to see you and good to have you in a new location, not the uh, – not where you live this summer, not home in Buffalo, but in your dorm room there. And uh, so this will be the view we'll see from here on out, for at least for the rest of the year, maybe. Yeah, I, I probably Do you have to kick your roommates out. I, I mean, I could work on the visual appearances in the back, but yeah, That's I kicked right. the roommate. He didn't care, but I kicked yeah. him out anyway. What did uh, What did he say when you told him that you do a podcast every Thursday? <laughs> he kind of laughed, and then he was like, "Wait, really?" Um, <laughs> and then I made him, <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and then I made him follow the Facebook page and all that. Nice. So. Oh, that was so. That's your roommate. Yeah. Nice. So nice. I might get some. I might get some fellow terps to start following the show. We'll see. Yeah. We could be big on the campus there. Yeah. Yeah. You could be a. You could be a superstar. Sure. A, 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 a superstar. <laughs> We were listening to that the other night. Uh, by the way, speaking of listening, we've changed our pre-show music uh, offering. And uh, so if you join us for the live show, uh, we got a new way to do it. We used to <laughs> illegally just broadcast whatever we wanted out across live stream, and we never did it on YouTube. So well, I should say never. Every once in a while, I'd sneak into YouTube and get shut down. We talked about that on a couple podcasts back, I think two back, 132. We talked about Mike getting banned on YouTube. And so... Of course, whenever there's a problem like that, I immediately the brain goes to work, and I thought, all right, what can we do where we can broadcast legally? And so I looked into a few different sites, and really the best one I found out there is called Groove Shark. If you haven't checked that out yet, G R O O V E S H A R K, GrooveShark.com. Create an account. You can go out there, and um, you can actually stream you uh, for free on your browser. You can listen to any music that you want. They have. The license uh, licenses for almost all the major music organizations, and so a lot of that music's available out there. You can actually upload your music to their your your music to their site as well, 
and I think they music match at that point. But um, lots of different options. The way we do it is you can actually create a broadcast channel. So if you go out to the averageguy.tv slash music, that is my broadcast channel. And uh, you can head out there and what we're going to do about an hour before the show, we'll jump in and I'll take requests on music. It's kind of fun. Mike and I messed with it. Uh, we did it for tonight's show and it was uh, five or six guys jumped out. Mike and I wasted about three hours <laughs> on it the other night, right? We got together yeah. and we were just, I was DJing and he was adding music in and we were talking about the music we liked and it's a pretty cool mic. I mean, you think it's it is it's a pretty huge, cool, right? It is a huge time suck because you get you get in there and you start remembering all these songs you want to play, and you just keep going and going and going, and you build up a list and you don't want to leave until those songs are done. But before they're done, you think of other songs you want to listen to, and it just keeps going. That's you're right. We spent about three hours with that. Before we know it, you know, three know. hours are over. Like, it was midnight. We're like, oh man, we got to go to bed. But you know, we picked up a couple listeners in the uh, in the process as we were out there messing around, and then I, th the next night you were testing it out, and I jumped on your your station, and uh, mm -hmm. it's kind of fun. I mean, it's it's so it so if you're uh, if you're gonna come out and listen to us live, you and you want to be a part of that, you don't necessarily have to create a Groove Shark account to to pull that off. Um, you can just listen, but they do have chat, and you can make suggestions into the DJ, which would be me. Um, that would uh, allow you to kind of influence the music. So let's have fun with it. Join us out 7 p.m. Central, so an hour before the show starts. 8 p.m. is when we start. Join us out there, GrooveShark.com. Actually, if you just go to theaverageguy.tv slash music, and I'll have that in the show notes as well, but you can head out, and that's the station. From time to time, I think there's no reason not to, anytime you're listening to music, just to start broadcasting it, right? Yeah. And, you know, the other fun thing is if you have more than just the two of us in there, as one person makes suggestions, other people can almost vote on it by like thumbs up in it, or I don't think you can thumbs down, but thumbs up in it, and it moves it up in the rankings, and then the broadcaster, or DJ, which is you, can uh, choose to use one of those that are higher ranked. Yeah, it's kind of like American Idol for the uh, for all music that's already done. Yep. So you choose the music, come out and join us Thursday nights. Uh, another reason to come join us live. Lots of good stuff going on live, and... Uh, I didn't finish on the meetup, but if you still want to head out, we are getting ready to do that, and a lot of folks are coming in for the meetup in Indianapolis, so get ready to do that. And then um, we've had some good luck with the Tech Scholarship Fund, so if remember I've been talking about that. I'll mention it towards the end of the show, but if you're interested in reviewing something for us, we have a little bit of a fund set up to buy you that thing that you want to review. We'll ship it to you. You review it either on the show or in a post form, and you get to keep it. It's pretty cool. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Hey, Jim, the guy out there in chat uh, wanted you to do something before we go any further. If you can run up on the roof and move your antenna a little bit to the left, your, your video is a little bit blurry. I saw that. It was Tim. <laughs> Although he said he took Dramamine with his beer. He's fine now. So I guess my picture is clearing up. It's, uh, is you're still saying this? So uh, just from a tech standpoint, we notice now in the Hangout that uh, if you have really good video, a little HD symbol shows up at the bottom right-hand corner of your so, Mike, say something. Something. Up yeah. I, 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 is mine still saying HD? What did you say? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it looked like a little earlier it went away, but yeah. yeah. No, it's there. It's there now. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Google continues to make really good improvements to these Google Hangout infrastructures. In fact, starting a couple new podcasts uh, where I'm not in the podcast. I'm helping some folks start some podcasts. And uh, we're just going straight to Google Plus and uh, Google Hangouts on air. So, some good stuff. Thanks, Google for putting that stuff in there. All right, I have a bunch of stuff uh, at the end of the show that we'll talk about, but we wanted to catch up with Christian a little bit. He's been uh, doing some crazy things on the road and abroad and all those. Uh, no, I don't think you've been abroad, but <laughs> Christian, what do you got for us uh, here in Christian's Corner? Yeah, so a lot of stuff, and I'm just going to broadly label it stuff, has transpired since a couple weeks back when I hopped on. So... Um, wow, I, I don't really know where to start, but I guess I'll start with stuff. So, um, first on the plate, um, I'm now situation-wise on campus at Maryland, in case that somehow didn't get across the last time I mentioned it. Um, 
it's really quite amazing how many people can show up on one particular sidewalk trying to get between a class from 12 to 1. And not only is everyone packed like sardines on the sidewalk, but then you have a bike and you're switching between street and sidewalk and grass and mountaintops. And, you sport uh, a bike there? <laughs> it's the only way to get around campus. Nice. I, I can get from end to end to campus in like five minutes if I go downhill. It's about seven or eight if I'm going back uphill, but if you try and do it walking, some of my classes it would take over 20 minutes to walk to, and I only have 10 minutes, a uh, 10 minute gap period between between some of my classes, so I'm flying from one end to the other half the time. So, um, I actually, believe it or not, I'm my room is right by the uh, stadium. Really? So whenever there's game night football, you can just sit right from your window and, and yeah. know who's winning. Okay, so um, you cheer the crowd, right? Yeah, and you also get the, the nice stadium lights flooding your room for the, for the weekend. Um, classes have been really good. Um, pretty much everything has been smooth sailing, save for um, calculus, which at Maryland is all theory-based instead of application-based, which makes it much more trickier to follow. So... It's kind of where my first priority is academically. Um, and also the cybersecurity so far has been a lot of fun and uh, there's a lot of cool stuff going on. Um, we have a AC's launch event uh, September 25th, really high visibility. Um, it's the official launch of the first cybersecurity program that uh, I'm a member of with 57 other students um, in the Honors College at Maryland. And the president of the university, the chancellor of the university school system, the CEO of Northrop Grumman, Wes Bush, and a handful of other uh, celebrities will be there in attendance. Um, and they'll also be nominating one speaker from our class to uh, participate in that. So um, really there's just a lot of cool stuff going on with that program, uh, and it's, it's a good part to uh, participate in. Um, and in terms of where I'll be next week, I think I'll probably change the scenery up and do a broadcast from my office just to spice things up. Do from everyone what you else's skipped there for a second, from show. where? So, Christian, what did you uh, From my office. From your office, all right. Good enough? Yes. So um, that will be and fun. Where uh, is your office at? It's at uh, SGT headquarters, which is in Greenbelt, Maryland. Um, and in context of larger pictures, if you don't know Maryland geography too well, it's about 25 minutes outside of D.C. Um, so if you think of D.C. right in the center and then you draw a circle around D.C., on the bottom of that circle is Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and the top of that circle, probably around 2 o'clock area, is where College Park is. And then okay. in the center is D.C. So pretty much everything on that circle is, is linked into Union Station and the MARC trains. And, um, I mean, whether you're on the top circle or the bottom circle, it's all federal stuff going on. The so. D.C. Metro doesn't come out to you, does it? Oh, yeah. Um, I does. just hop on a... There's a College Park line from the Mark train that's like a mile from where I'm staying at, and you just take the Mark train and it goes straight into Union Station. Okay, all right. Yeah, we, you know, I lived in in uh, Northern Virginia there at Fort Belvoir for a while. We used to jump on the Metro and take the Metro into D.C. It was just really the only way to travel in D.C. It's such the traffic so bad. Sure. sure. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So you're you're getting cool. around. Are, are all right. You, you, are you you driving? Yeah. You got your car there, or are you, how are you getting to work? Not yet. The uh, car is a work in progress, as I like to label it. It's a whip, um, which means that I'm primarily taking what's called Shuttle UM, which is a free bus service on campus that drops me off about 0.1 miles from the office. So um, it's not bad. It takes me probably around 25 to 30 minutes there and back, uh, to get there one way, which isn't terrible, but what, in reality it would be like a 10-minute drive with a car. But... Um, Depending on what I do in the future, I'm going to need it anyway. So at some point, I'll bite the bullet. It's just a question of when. And um, I'll probably be doing some work travel um, in my winter recess um, for NASA. So that will also necessitate transportation requirements. So Yeah, you'll, you'll be a busy kid for sure. Hey, we're getting a little latency from you, so just don't be surprised if we walk, we, you know, we walk over each other. So 
Yeah, I should have hardwired, but I didn't have oh, time you go, to. You go on so. Wi-Fi. Yeah, no sweat. Yeah. We'll, we'll get it. We'll get you improved each week. We'll improve your quality. Sure. Yeah. So, so entertainment is a key there, right? For any college student, entertainment is the key, right? Get finding the right ways to get entertainment. You have found a pretty, a pretty good way to get all your entertainment ported right into your room there. Yes. So, of course, everyone's ears are going to start tuning out if I say the application right up front because we always talk about it. So I'm going to refrain from saying the application name and tell you what I've done so that you can get excited. And then when I say the application name and you go, wait, what? Then you can just quietly simmer and say, wow, that's actually pretty cool. So imagine if you could tune over 1,800 HD files television stations from your car, from your cell phone, from your desktop, from your laptop, or anything that has a browser and can connect to the internet? And the answer to that question is now you can. And not only can you do it once or twice, but you can do it up to three concurrent connections with the setup I have. And if you get the extended edition, up to six. And what this is, is a combination of the HD Home Run Prime sitting on my home network being tied in directly to none other than everyone's favorite application on this show, Subsonic. So now I can stream HD Files Television straight to my dorm room. It's kind of pretty awesome because no one else gets these stations here, so they all run into the lounge to get their Ravens games. Um, if I'm going to SGT and I'm on the bus, I can pull up my news stations right on my Galaxy Note 2, and I can stream that in high definition or in standard quality, and even in high definition where there's 350,000 IPs on the University of Maryland's network all fighting for bandwidth, I can stream without a single blip, a single graphics issue, a single sound garble, or any pause in my stream. So Wait a minute, how do you know that there's that many IPs on that network? That's for me to know and for you to think about. I thought so. <laughs> they have they have general uh, approximations of um, yeah, total yeah, devices yeah, yeah. on network, but um, once once I'm formally vetted for the cybersecurity stuff, I'm gonna have to start shutting my mouth on that more and more. But that's that's publicly knowledgeable information. So, okay, uh, all right, just to make sure. That one's clear. But actually, University of Maryland in and of itself is its own ISP. And uh, I'm amazed at how good the internet connection is from wherever you are. I mean, you can walk anywhere on campus. There's Wi-Fi. Um, you get a consistent 10 down on wired no matter where you are, which is pretty good when, like I said, there's 36,000 students alone hitting the network, not to count all the other servers and devices and faculty and so on and so forth. Um, and apparently I've heard stories that when people get off the campus for and it's like winter break, there's people hitting like 600 down to their dorm room who are still on campus because the QoS readjusts for the, the load. So, I mean, they have a huge T1 pipe coming in, and they're their own Internet service providers. So, I mean, they're, they're doing a real pro job at the network here, and it's pretty sophisticated. Um, and there's a lot of third-party people that access the network that are affiliates of the university, too. So uh, really quite sophisticated. But, I mean, the fact that I can get HD Fios television from Buffalo, New York, streaming without a, without a hitch, no matter where I am, um, is a really nice feature, especially because I don't have to set up Windows Media Center anymore. Um, I don't have to configure tuners. Um, recorded TV, I just program at home and then I can pull it in over VPN so I don't really have to worry about doing that um, but I mean come on anything that has a browser and, and can go to a subsonic address that's a pretty cool functionality to have um, this project was first attempted back in 2011 there was like some mild success with it on Linux but no one had gotten it working on Windows um, and even with Linux, there was a lot of transcoding and streaming issues that, uh, fortunately, because of one of the recent updates to the 
HD Home Run firmware and API, I was able to leverage one of the newer functionalities in the device to get it to work. So basically streams right into um, the JW player, which is what um, Subsonic runs on, and then FFmpeg does the transcoding uh, behind the scenes, which is the native transcoder for Subsonic. But, I mean, like I said, it's it's really fantastic to be able to queue up HD and put it on the big screen and... Um, it's it's simple and you don't even have to it's it's just plug it plug and play. So Christian, let me ask you this: Is Subsonic a replacement for Media Center? I mean, we've had a lot of talk on the Facebook page. If you go out to theaverageguy.tv/facebook, that's our Facebook group. We've had a lot of talk about the death of Media Center. We all know it's going away. I mean, realistically, can't for both internal and external use of your own media, including your own TV turn- tuners, is Subsonic a viable replacement for watching everything in the house? I mean, is there a player I can use that uses the Subsonic service inside to pull that media without having yeah. to have a PC set up? I mean, I think it's kind of... All right, so let's start with some, some ground rules here. I think it's absolutely absurd that Microsoft is getting rid of Windows Media Center. <laughs> absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think it's absolutely absurd that they're going to let... Uh, Apple walk all over them with their Apple TV, and the, I mean, Apple's rolling this out full time, and Microsoft's like, oh, I don't know, let's pull out of the market. But um, in any case, um, that's probably another reason why there's a bit of an executive change at Microsoft happening. Just a little bit. Um, but in that that being said, I mean, there is always a how should I put this? There's always a need for. Um, a media center application. And I think the problem people get mixed up with is what defines a media center application. And to me, it's not just the television. Like, yeah, I can do channels and stuff, but it's kind of like the whole thing. So think about how, you know, your your standard Fios set-top box has live TV, video on demand, and recorded storage space, right? So, like, for example, in this Subsonic solution, I get the live TV wherever I am, which is fantastic um, and really cuts out of the picture, you know, oh, well, I don't have the, you know, I don't have the um, the Windows Media Center DRM software installed on this and blah, blah, blah. You know, you just hit a play button and there it is, uh, regardless of the device. Um, that being said, I think a big component of what makes a media center a media center is being able to record and archive and save TV. Um, obviously, I think that has become intermixed with kind of the video on demand services that cable companies provide, whereas before that stuff really became popular, just the idea that you could record live TV to a hard drive was revolutionary before we started, you know, streaming free television and I think what has started to change that paradigm is you start to see a lot of, um, like, for example, if you're looking at uh, series television, if you go to something like USA Network and you play any of their, like, frontline um, uh, front episodes, right, new episodes, you just, at, at this point, you just type in your subscription account. So if you're a Verizon Fios customer, you type in your Fios account, and it validates you as, being a paying TV customer, and then, yeah, you can watch all that stuff, and it's no big deal. They have the whole season up there. Um, so I think a combination of those three kind of uh, features of uh, absorbing media is important, but really an all-inclusive media center shouldn't just include the television. It should include the music, the video, the, you know, the whole works, and I think Subsonic does a really good job of that, save for, in my solution, there's no recording TV functionality. Now, if I wanted to get really clever and creative, I could definitely do that, but it's, you know, a lot of programming I don't feel like doing. So live, um, live is available, but recording is not on Subsonic. Yeah, because because for me, it's just as easy to schedule a recorded television through remote desktop and then sign out, because, I mean, uh, and not even that, but all the things that I want to record are, are on a schedule already, so the media center sets the recording already, dumps it on our network drive, and then it's it's available in Subsonic. So right, right. it's not like, so really, Subsonic does give you that recorded TV functionality. It's just you set you set your recording device on a schedule so that you're not doing the scheduling in Subsonic. Yeah, and um, that's fair, right? You would log into the Subsonic control panel, whatever, right? Set sure. those, those to record. They record to a folder, and then the viewing is done through the Subsonic player, so to speak, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I can watch any recorded TV that we record off Media Center or every, anywhere else on Subsonic. It just automatically, the, the, the place that Media Center dumps it to is the same place where Subsonic looks to pick it up. So it's it's really intuitive in that sense. So, I mean, Subsonic can really, is the most versatile in the sense that any device, mobile, desktop, is going to be able to play your content live or streamed with the solution I've implemented. Um, but really... I think the notion that Media Center is dead is is a crappy one because there needs to be some kind of theater entertainment system still. And uh, to be honest, for me, a web interface doesn't qualify as a as a theater system. Yeah. Right. So that in, I mean, and like I said, if I just want to pull up a television station and watch from wherever. I'm definitely going with Subsonic. You know, why bother with Windows Media Center? But if I'm in a home environment where I got, you know, the 5.1 surround system and it's the 60-inch plasma and it's a dedicated computer running that box, you're damn right I want it to be Microsoft Windows Media Center and I just want to hit the the Windows Media Center remote control and, and go, you know, go watch television. So I think it's stupid that it's being phased out. Um I think you can clearly see Microsoft is indecisive about what they do because you can still get it as an add-on for Windows 8 and 8.1, so why it's now this magical add-on to the operating system is also absurd. Um, but look at all the open source um, media center applications out there. XMBC continues to gain popularity on all sorts of devices. Um, I've tested XMBC, and it can pick up all the HD home run tuners without a problem. Um, there's uh, like t there's Media Run. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that's out there. What about Plex? Um, yeah, uh, I have not had personal experience with Plex. I've actually seen some um, talk about. I when I was doing some home run research, saw Plex come up into the discussion for integration with Home Run, um, but I don't really have enough experience with that software to make a comment other than that. Um, if there's some amazing feature that that has that something like Windows Media Center which used to be out of the box doesn't then I don't really know what the adoption point is. Plex well, just has a really nice interface. Go ahead Mike. Well we you know we have one computer on Windows 8 with um, with Media Center on it and it uses a whole house DVR and then we have two of our three TVs have an Xbox 360 that we use as extenders for Media Center and it just it works you know, beautifully. Once you get it up, you can record from there. You can watch. You know, we have a large hard drive in there, so we can record a lot of shows and we can do all that. Now they're talking about the Xbox One not having, not being an extender. I'm probably going to buy another 360 and put it on our third TV because I was waiting for the one. But I think we're going to do that. I wonder why uh, Microsoft didn't go with just adding a um, one of those what are the cable cards or whatever it is. Yeah, because I got the HD Home Run Prime. That's how we're getting it on. Th sure. through the Xbox, and you put one of those cards in there, why why not just have that as an option in the Xbox 360? We just plug that thing in there, and bam, now you have that as your, your cable box. Yeah, this might be somewhat of an uneducated answer, but my first thought would be that it would probably drive the price of the unit up significantly because um, just think of the home run. It has a device to read that that card, it has a decoding and decryption um, unit in it, and then the transcoding. Yeah, Xbox should have that built in with its GPU. But um, yeah, I, th I, I, I would imagine it would add some MSRP. I think some of the problem with like the Prime is probably everybody who's watching the show has no problem setting it up or dealing with a cable company. But the average consumer, you know, the cable company guys are not all that smart. You know, every time I have a cable guy come out to the house, he comes and says. Something like your TiVo not working? I said no, TiVo's working fine. My internet's out. And every time they come to the house, they come for the wrong reason. I got to set them up, right? So when I went to get my cable card for my HD Home Run Prime, I just went there and told them, I'm getting this for my. I went to the the local store and told them I'm getting it for my TiVo. I didn't tell them anything about the Prime because they would have been all confused and uh, not done it right. Just I'm getting it for my TiVo. I bring it home, then I set it up. Yeah. So I think that's part of what's made it more difficult for Microsoft is these cable companies don't have much of incentive to do it, and then their customer support is horrible sure to the average consumer. Sure. Yeah. I mean, really, I'm kind of surprised that 
I, I don't know. I, I guess for at least thinking for Fios, probably one of the attraction points for them keeping people hooked on the set-top boxes is sucking in the money for video on demand because there's a bunch of suckers who go on there and spend five bucks a day on stuff that they can get a bunch of other places for a lot less money. Um, so I imagine that's in an effort to try and keep it Verizon branded stuff. Um, to me, it would be interesting if they just went all, you know, uh, they just started handing out those cable cards as your device, and then it was on, the, just like it's on the consumer to, you know, go out and buy a computer, it's on the consumer to go out and buy their TV device, right? And yeah. then all the cable company is doing is providing you their encryption, whatever, right? So... It's going to be yeah. interesting to see how this changes, because I think the stranglehold that these cable companies have over us is going to be slowly whittled away. Yeah, I imagine it will... I mean, we've seen a lot of the merging of TV and computer. I mean, that was pretty much well forecasted years ago. Um, and I think the ultimate resolution of that will be when set-top boxes are no more. Um, and that will mean that Verizon and other companies will have to change their strategy because they're not... That what they aren't going to do is let go of getting all that money from video demand. Absolutely. So they're going to find a way to... They're going to have to find a way to do it through like an online service or something. But whatever they come up with, it's they're going to have to find a way to do it uh, through something other than a set-top box. Um, and I'm sure that's doable. I mean, it's just a question of rethinking architecture. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the transition won't be in a smooth, easy one. No, they, they not won't at all. give up. They won't give up easily. No. And it'll, you know, they got to find a way to make money. I mean, we like stuff for free, and that doesn't pay, that doesn't build infrastructure, you know, for companies. So we're gonna have to give a little, get a little in the process. We're gonna have to give up some of the. We still got to pay for it in some way. Although I pay seventy five bucks a month for my internet, so I'm. <laughs> it's not like it's. It's not like the internet's free. I don't have a bandwidth yeah. cap, but it's not like the internet's free for me. So, yeah. I don't. It's so really, really, what will what should start to transpire is that uh, here's a really bizarre idea. Rather than having a TV bill and an internet bill, you just have an internet bill, and that internet bill includes yeah television media services. Yeah. As a, so you pay for your bandwidth. You pay for your your speed, you pay for your media streaming services, and and that's it. And the idea of television gets blown away. Well, yeah. we already see that happening, right? We're in the early stages of both Amazon Prime and Amazon Prime Video and Netflix being Netflix. very very successful with just streaming video. So, yeah, the, ca the caveat there being that they're not providing internet to you. Correct. Right. Correct. And but, we we also one thing we got to get away with is these artificial caps that the uh, cable companies and the internet service providers make up and they give you excuse you know, sort of like the we're doing this for your own protection type you know. yeah th those but, will crumble I mean yeah. look at the the cable companies already know that their 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 ship is sunk with the evolution of Fios I mean Fios has forced all these companies to bring up their their band I mean it's unlimited on Fios so mm -hmm. any any person who has Fios in their area and some cable company he says, well, you only get, you know, 100 gigabytes of bandwidth a month. They're just going to say, yeah, see ya, uh, Fios, plug it in. Um, so, and I mean, look at Australia in the last year. They, they've just blown away the whole thing. They have a, they have a, their government has installed, you know, high-powered bandwidth that, you know, Andrew's, Andrew's over there getting 100 down for the same price we are for 35 down. So at, at some point it's going to have to break. Well, and that's a good point because competition, being files, being a competition, uh, will make things change. Without, a, but I'll be enforced to. They won't do it. Yeah, yeah. We we need good competition for yeah. sure. Because you need you need a choice. Like where I'm at, my choice is my cable company, or even worse, DSL, and that's it. You know, that's there's not much of a choice there. And I live in a, a you know in an Atlanta city area, Atlanta area. So it's not like a, a minor market. I live in a major market, and there's really that's my choice, those two. I would love to have a Fios choice. Sure. Yeah, sure. We, we don't have Fios either, Christian. So, 
you know, it's it's that's got to roll out into more markets, and mm -hmm. you know, we we see Google really making a run at this with their, you know, with their, um, you know, with their rollout of gigabit uh, everywhere, and and so that that'll put some pressure as they start moving into cities and say, okay, if you guys aren't willing to do it, we'll do it. You know, we got billions of dollars behind it, we'll make it happen. And I think that'll begin to put some downward pressure on it. So, uh, be interesting yeah. to see. I I think we, we've got some pretty cool stuff. I mean, what you're talking about here. Pretty cool that you're able to sure. do this. You know, yeah, you're on the East Coast. Yeah, you have Fias at home. Yeah, you got a dad who, you know, you got a, a subsonic administrator <laughs> at home that uh, is probably one of the most knowledgeable guys in all of subsonic, you know, in that, in that entire infrastructure. Um, so you got a lot of stuff going for you there. That's definitely not average guy stuff for the most part. Um, but I, I think the average guy could set up, you know, Gary and I had talked about subsonic at one point. I even had a subsonic server running here at at my place, I, I don't any any longer just because I wasn't, it, I didn't have the time to keep it up, but um, or work with it. But uh, yeah, you get some pretty good stuff rolling on there, so very cool. Let's yeah. move on I mean, a little it's, bit. It's average, oh. it's, it's average guy usage, not average guy setup. Yeah, um, yeah, and you know what? It's probably average or above average tech guy setup. I'm not, I don't consider myself. Yeah, you know, the above I, average I, tech guy, and I was able to get it set up and running. Yeah, I, I think the music and stuff is pretty out of the box, but once you start getting into video and transcoding, and then my TV solution is me writing a bunch of scripts that I never really automated for public use yet. So. Yeah, yeah, no, pretty cool. All right, speaking of public use, I want you to talk a little bit about you and I have been going round and round with the average guy TV, and some servers that it's set up on, and sure. uh, you know I don't. The average guy TV, you know, we get uh, we get a couple hundred hits a day, and it's not a big site. But you've learned a few things through the process. Talk, kind of go back a little bit. Talk about what you've learned as a you know as a host provider, which is basically what you are for me. Sure. So uh, back August twentieth, I started fighting the evil monster, um, where uh, like inconsistently out of the blue, I have three VPS nodes all running CentOS you know, latest versions, everything's up to date, best customized scripts you can imagine for running the server. Um, and the first, the, the two were fine, um, but the one, the the high-powered 8-core that runs BIOS mods and Average Guy and a couple other sites all in the same node started, like, inconsistently losing network connectivity. And it would, it would go down for, like, a couple hours, then it would just show back up, and it would and would keep doing this thing, right? And the only way I could get it to stick itself back on the network was to keep rebooting the box remotely. So I'd be sending in reboot commands and reboot commands, and that got really tiring, and so then I opened up a ticket with Verpus and said... You got uh, sick of getting texts from me. Hey, Christian, it's down again. <laughs> yeah, I was like, Verpus, you need to fix this network, At one point or you I need were to like, tell hey, my customers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, either... Either you guys are going to fix your network or I'm going to tell my customers that I have to move them to another provider because you weren't willing to, you know, fix your own network. So, oh, blah, 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 and we've sent it to our ISP. And then they come back and they start telling me, um, your website's under attack. It's a DDoS. And I'm sitting here going, bullshit, because I can turn the website off in its entirety and it still goes on and offline, right? So I'm, I'm pretty PO'd at this point. Um, I get the SLA refund credit for the month because it was just totally inexcusable. Um, and then I start poking around and eventually, as a stopgap measure to like keep the thing afloat, I installed Cloudflare over the, the VPS. So what Cloudflare basically is, is it's a, for people who don't know, it's a what's called the Content uh, Distribution Network, a CDN. And what that is, is essentially you have all these high-powered servers in different locations throughout the world, and the CDN basically copies content from your web server and farms it out across all the servers in the world. And that way, when someone hits your site, it gets the, the files that put together your website from the nearest server that you're located to. So your, your latency is a lot lower. Um, in, in theory, your downloads are a lot faster and the site pops together a lot faster and it's lo it's a load balance solution meaning that not everyone is hitting that VPS to pull data it's getting it a mix from different CDNs and then some from the VPS so really Cloudflare acts as a layer over the VPS that any traffic that comes to your site 
has to get through Cloudflare before Cloud, and then Cloudflare is the only thing that can pull to and from the VPS, right? So in order to do that, um, I got that up and running, and surprisingly enough, uh, the server kind of stabilized itself out around the same time. But I really wanted it online just so that it, you know, kept the server from uh, having issues. And uh, that did a couple things for me. Um, it helped with the load, even though load was not really an issue. It gave me some more uniform load and performance and consistency. Um, I was concerned with it because it was a lot slower at first, but as people started to use the websites and the content was able to distribute across the Cloudflare network, it started to pick up. And I mean, just from a latency perspective, if I used to ping that VPS from home, it would be around 90 to 100 milliseconds, right? If I ping that same website from here with Cloudflare enabled, it's 5 milliseconds. So right there you have 20-fold latency improvements. Now 100 milliseconds is not a bad latency at all, but a 5 millisecond latency, that's virtually, you know, bam. Um, and also just to show you the importance of latency versus location, um, it was 100 milliseconds when I was up in Buffalo, but now that I'm sitting at an ISP in DC, it's only 50 milliseconds from that raw time, right? So location really has a big factor in latency, which is important in, you know, being able to deliver the content, right? So eventually they get back to replying to this ticket and they're saying it's under DDoS, blah, blah, blah. And then they start load feeding me this line about how I'm under a SYN flood, which basically S-Y-N, um, which means, um, you know, th these certain subnets of IPs are flooding the box, in which I replied, that's the Cloudflare network that I had to install because you guys stink at running your network, right? <laughs> so I can either remove that and have you rerun the same test that shows it's your network, or we can move on, right? So they go back and say, no, 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 don't do that. Go to Cloudflare and under threat control, set the security level to I'm under attack, which basically means that whenever someone hits your website, it does this little pause thing for three seconds and says Cloudflare is scanning your um, your device to make sure that it's not malicious, right? Um, and so I started getting some interesting results from that. Picked up a couple, you know, web bots and stuff, but it wasn't really anything. I mean, a, a couple spam IPs, but nothing that would have caused the network issues that we were having, right? So um, eventually. I started to look at operating system logs because I knew it really was nothing with the web server because I already had a pretty good blacklist of IPs on the, on port 80. Um, but what I didn't discover was that port 22 was getting hammered by China, the People's Republic of North Korea, uh, and Brazil. And what port 22 is for any VPS is a... Um, that is where your secure shell traffic takes place. So when you're in the Linux world, everything's happening through a command prompt, through shell, and through what's ultimately referred to as a terminal. And all that traffic takes place over port 22. So it's just like, it's just like using a remote desktop, except it's a command line interface for Linux machines, right? And that port is how I get into the server and have network connectivity, right? So it was no wonder that when I would try and SSH in and it would freeze up and lock up, it was because some guy in Brazil was trying to brute force his way into the root user account. So there's um, these bots that sit out on the internet looking for open port 22s, and then they just start dictionary attacking the thing in the whole nine yards. Um, and I had found several... I mean, not just Brazil, but there were a couple people in China doing the same thing all at once on the server over the course of, like, the last two weeks. Um, now, the interesting part is some of the dates that there was server problems, uptime, downtime, corresponded with the SSH attacks. But the first couple didn't, so I'm still going to blame those on Verpus, but then mm -hmm. I think what started to transpire is after the initial whatever it was that Verpus screwed up at, the stuff that came later that I thought was still Verpus had to be this SSH stuff. Um, so at first, my first approach was to say, I'm going to capture all the IP addresses that Cloudflare identified as malicious and that were trying to brute force their way into my server, which is another reason why you need a strong password, especially if it's a root account. Um, 
and just blacklist those in the IP tables firewall, reboot, and fine. And believe it or not, as soon as I did that, it was quiet for maybe about 12 hours, and then guess what? New IP address from China showed up trying to do the same thing again. So eventually I got really pissed off at certain XYZ countries, and so I decided to ultimately, my ultimate solution was to run a script that blocks entire countries. All the IP address ranges that belong to a particular country I blocked. So I blocked all of China, I blocked all of North and South Korea, I blocked all of Brazil, all of Spain, all of Argentina, uh, all of Indonesia, and I think there was one other one that was not on my happy list. And <laughs> not, not on now, your happy list. I like that. Yeah, and when I say blocking those countries, I'm not blocking them from accessing the website on port 80, which is web traffic. I'm blocking them from accessing the administrative ports that allows them to start hitting that server and guessing at root passwords. So I basically just block countries that can't have access to those ports. Um, this is a common... Christian, uh, would you want to just block every... So if you're the only one getting into that administrative port, wouldn't, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be easier just to block everybody except the IPs you're coming from? Yeah, ideally... Um, that would be the solution, except I'm on the move so much that I'm, you know, my public IP is changing uh, quite frequently, and so I would have to keep VPNing in back to my home network, setting in new IPs that change, sure. and then, sure. you know, being able to SSH in. So ideally, I would only want to, I would want to restrict it to USA only, but just blocking all the IP ranges in the countries that I listed previously um, was over 23,000 IP ranges that I had to add to an entry that took about 15 minutes for the server to process and, and add. Um, so to do that for all countries except the U.S. would probably take at least a couple of days and would suck up okay. way too much CPU. Sure. Um, because you have to you have to block it by ranges. There's not there's nothing magical um, in the Linux kernel that looks up an IP's location and then blocks or denies it. I mean, I could write a script for it, but it would take some time, right? Sure. Um, so this was kind of the... I basically just picked the places where there's consistent threats from with these types of bots yeah, and, and dealt with it that way. Um, I used to have a script that would notify me whenever someone logged into the server, which was good in case someone who wasn't supposed to be logging in did, but it's really not useful when... Um, it doesn't tell you failed attempts, which I could have modified the script to do failed attempts, but the original mail server I was sending out, that was a Gmail, that once I enabled two-factor authentication, changed the whole password thing, and then that thing stopped working too. So um, really this was kind of the best solution. Sure. Um, this is normally, in the sysadmin world, um, the, big, the other big example is when people leave their MySQL port open for database access, which is port 3306. Now, for me, that's an example where the only IPs that I have to allow access to that port are the web servers that need to access it. So no one can try and brute force that port unless they gain access to the web server that's actually serving web pages, which is only two other IPs, right? So... Um, and that's that's your ideal situation of lockdown and control. So by default, my firewall says block all these ports except for, you know, your port 80, your 443, your 22, etc. And then in my case, the custom solution for this was, you know, block the countries that are giving you a hard time. So um, once I kind of got that in place, I took, I had average guy on DDoS protection from Cloudflare um, I took tag entirely off of Cloudflare because it wasn't really getting enough um, uh, current hits to warrant needing a CDN. So I, you know, it's fa it's actually faster in that situation for it to just access the VPS directly and return it back. Um, but I've actually I've left for now as a experiment. I've left Cloudflare enabled for BIOS mods because I've actually seen a really nice rebound in traffic ever since I've done that, which is surprising, actually. But because BIOS Mods gets a lot of worldwide traffic, so um, I actually would imagine that it's it's very plausible that that CDN is doing a better time serving the overseas customers because there's a lot of servers in... Um, there's a lot of servers in... 
uh, well, you have, that's, you have a, that Cloudflare has abroad. Yeah. So. Well, and you you get a lot, like you said, with BIOS mods, you get a lot of you get a more global reach. You know, I think as I look, uh, you know, we do about 2,500 to 3,000 hits a month uh, at the average guy. So not, you know, not a ton. It's a great community. I appreciate you guys out there listening and hitting the site. We get way more traffic to the site, I think, from people finding us on Google than you guys going out, by the way, you, the listeners, going out to the site and hitting it. I just don't, I just think I, I've watched that over the course of a day and, Man, I, I know I get some hits from places that we don't have listeners. So I know they're finding it. You know, we see the reference, too, that's in there. But you're right, Christian. We just don't have enough. For a small little site like ours, uh, or like mine, the average guy, eh, that probably doesn't make sense. We can serve up that content. You know, we use YouTube for our video content. Uh, the audio stream is pretty easy to do. It just it works pretty well by not necessarily pushing that global. Sure, yeah, and I mean the other thing too is like you have to remember that on um, a Cloudflare actually tells you a lot of interesting things that you might not get directly out of um, Google Analytics, and one of the things it tells you is percent people versus percent crawlers and bots, um, and if I pull up the analytics right now. Um, yeah, see, September 4th had a rocket, super rocket traffic day, and I, like I said, I think that's because of CDN, but in any case, I'll shut up about that. Um, the, one of the pie charts shows regular traffic versus crawlers and bots, and BIOS Mods gets 13% of its total page views is crawlers and bots, and you may think, well, what, what's, what's going on there? In one day... Cloudflare has measured Google uh, crawling 14,477 pages on BIOS mods. It's measured Bing at 11,577. So the difference between a site like Tag and a site like BIOS mods is that there are these internet harvesters like Google and Bing constantly crawling and indexing the site. So the performance has to be there all the time because the crawling happens all the time. Whereas when... See, and, and because BIOS Mods is a dynamic content generator, that's why the, the crawling and the routines happen so often. Whereas a site like um, a site like The Average Guy, where it's a much more targeted audience, location, etc., um, the crawling doesn't have to happen as often because we're publishing content. It's not a dyna- it's not as dynamic, right? right? right. So we don't have forums. We don't generally we don't have a lot of people making comments. So the the data is not changing. Sure. Um, But like I said, and this has a really cool, um, one of the really cool tools that I think is useful for any system administrator to get used to that I really, I guess, got some additional exposure to through Cloudflare is something called Project Honeypot. Um, Let's just define a honeypot first. So a honeypot is a basically a dummy device that sits out on the internet and waits to get hacked. So it has a certain set of programs, a certain set of rules and stuff, and it just waits for an IP address to try and hack into it, right? So it makes itself a a walking target. And when that virus or that bot comes flying in there, that system captures everything it's doing to the system. And then on on the website, right? So the website is called Project Honeypot. And what it does is it tells you how the IP visited, what it did, what the impact was, and uh, how many times it saw the IP show up in other places on the Internet. So it's really useful for determining, is this an IP I want on my network or should I be blocking it? So that was a really nice uh, thing that I used where when Cloudflare identified an IP as being challenged, which means that it basically did a security check, I could go in and cross-reference it with the Project Honeypot database and see, okay, this IP address um, is from Germany. Um, It has a lot of email spam, so it's it's a mail server spammer. And it also says here that it's a dictionary attacker, meaning that it's going to be trying to brute force its way into anything that has a password field. Um, But one also interesting thing that um, is a problem, right, is that IP addresses are constantly changing, and the owners of IP addresses constantly change. So the owner of a malicious hacker's IP could suddenly be released and renewed to a completely innocent person who wants to view your content. So 
Um, one thing that's useful in Project Honeypot is it will tell you when it was first brought up on the network and when it was last kind of shown around. And there's a, a message that shows up on any record lookup um, that basically says, um, for I mean, for ones that it applies to, this IP has not seen any suspicious activity within the last three months. This IP is most likely clean and trustworthy now. And now, remember, that's kind of a conditional message, right? So you have to say, why is this IP showing up on my, you know, on my radar? You need to take some proactive steps into saying, is this IP doing legitimate traffic, or is this, you know, descriptive of what showed up in the past? And if so, block it, but don't just block it and move on. You should also go back to that community page that had that information and submit a comment. You know, it doesn't have to be long, but just submit a comment saying, you know, this IP is still active and spamming, and that will let people know that it should still be on their block list. Um, ideally, like with port 80 blocks and stuff, your web application, if it blocks something, should also say, you know, if you think this is in error, then, you know, go here and contact to be requested and et cetera. But, um, you know, sometimes you want hard blocks on, like, static spam IPs that you just know are not going to be given back to benevolent people who are interested in viewing your content. So. All right. Well, we had a, I mean, that was, uh, you, you learned a ton through that, that whole scenario, right? I mean, that was, that kind of forced you yeah, into some quick Yeah, I mean, learning. I think, yeah, I, it's, it's not like it's anything, I guess, new for me so much as the fact that it was kind of a new response because when people say DDoS, the typical thing is, oh, my site's down. But, you know, I, I turned off the website and knew that I was still having problems. So it was really just the intuition and me not being so insular and thinking that port 80 was the only kind of uh, route of, of avenue that... that uh, made me a better sysadmin, um, and is really a part of why I'm here for cybersecurity at yeah. University of Maryland. Um, not just defensive, but learning how the offense takes place too, so that um, I can be a smarter. Yeah, a smarter it was ironic dude. how that happened. At the, you know, you get to school and then you're going through all this, you know, cybersecurity yeah. stuff. And I thought we probably couldn't have planned that any better, um, even though we didn't plan it. Yeah, and it's but... kind of funny too because. I mean, they have uh, probably like 2,000 honeypots on the, on the University of Maryland's network, too, for us to play with. So, I mean, it's uh, nice. doing honeypots as a, as a characteristic component of defensive cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, and also learning that offense, obviously. So. No. You know, from an average guy standpoint, I had set up, when we talk about honeypots, I had actually set up my own PC in the house here that was not connected to the network that would have, uh, you know, I, I think I was running Windows 7 on it, maybe even Vista, I can't remember, it was a while back. And it just had, it would be the PC if ever, I, if ever I was working on someone's computer and I needed to plug a drive in for whatever reason, that was the PC I used. I'd fire it up and I'd plug it in just in case, right? There, that hard drive was infected with something or whatever and it had a couple, you know, I had about three different antivirus stuff you know, on it and some detection stuff. And it was just a really helpful tool. That's one of those tools to, to think about. If you're, you know, my, my PC support numbers have dropped with, with Windows 8. I'm just not even helping people with their computers anymore. They just, I don't get the calls like I used to. And it's really weird. It used to be yeah. I was helping people all the time, and now I get nothing. I get the occasional, my, I got infected, right? I still get that, and I just say, you just, you just need to reinstall Windows, you know, at this point. But, that had been a really helpful tool just to have that kind of honeypot, you know, in the in the in the background to use to make sure I wasn't throwing those drives on my systems. Yeah. You know? Um and I mean uh Drash and Outer Chat makes a good point about any open port being a vulnerability, um, which is why it's always good never to open a port unless you need to. Um but I, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that um like, for example, if you have a shared web host, for example, that MySQL port is open to everyone because, like, for example, take IX web hosting, right? So they assign you on a shared platform where a bunch of customers are accessing that same server. They can't just block the port, right? They don't know what your home IP is, right? right? So right, yeah. that's a serious hole, right? So, yeah. but... Normally, in a, in a shared environment, you don't even look or monitor about that. That's the, 
the provider's responsibility, right? Right. But when you get to the VPS level, same thing kind of happens in the sense that the VPS provider will open kind of all the default ports that are actually that's that's another lie. The VPS provider, the ISP, there's no firewall at the ISP level for your VPS, so it's it's on you to make sure that IP tables is up and blocking everything, which is what I do. Um, but clearly, um, leaving port 22 open for the whales was was dumb on my part. But um, I really because I had done a lot of Windows administration yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, probably three, four years yeah. ago. I mean, I didn't get into Linux web hosting until like three years ago. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't, I wasn't clearly thinking about port 22 being a, a point of entry, uh, which is, I know it sounds absurd, but... Um, <laughs> well, now it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, Christian, I want to wrap this. I want to go step back a little bit because Mike and I went through an exercise when we were setting up our PFSense routers. And it was more an exercise for me. Uh, Mike was telling me what to do when we were setting this up. But Mike, remember inside PFSense, even in your own, at your home level, there are some blocks that you can put in, right? You can run some things to block various countries from coming. Uh, Talk a little bit about that because you walked me through that. Yeah, so uh, PFSense comes with what they call packages, and um, and I'm running the, the older version. I think you're running a newer version, but both of them use packages, and I'm running a package called uh, Country Block and IP Block block List. So Country Block, you know, you can go in there, and I'm looking at it now, although I, I'm not showing you, but, you know, it's got top spammers, and it has Korea, China, India, Russia, Turkey, Vietnam, Ukraine, Brazil, Venezuela, and Pakistan, and I just block all those countries. It's just a, a and 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 um, PF Sense is just a you click it uh, checkbox and block all those countries. You can block more too. You can block. And uh, that when you say block country. it, that that means internally I can't go to those, I can't go to sites that are hosted in those countries. Yeah, I mean basically it knows it's it's using IP ranges for those countries and it's saying IP ranges for those countries you can't go to and they can't come to you. It'll mm-hmm. block them. From coming in to you, uh, also, which it's going to block anyway from a you know from a firewall standpoint. Right. Then right. The, the the there's another one called IP block list, and that one I'm not sure if you're running that one, but that one's where you can get a block list from various places that is a listing that somebody has compiled of all these bad IP addresses, and you can load it into your uh, into that package in PFSense, and now all those IP addresses are blocked. And that's the, the, the those are some pretty current the lists they suggest those are some pretty current lists right I mean Christian was saying you know IPs can drop and get reassigned but somebody's kind of um, keeping track of that right right you know some somebody's updating those and there's some, there's a lot of them there's a few of them that are very popular if you if you go into the uh, you know PFSense website you can get you know uh, on the forums you can find out which ones those are but you know I only have like one or two of them that are running that are more the more popular ones. Um, and those those work pretty well. You know, it keeps it keeps out um, all that junk. I have no reason to go to Korea and all those other places, so I just yeah, block them out. A lot of times, uh, not a necessary thing. That's a good for so what what Christian was doing at the server level. You know, you can do on a PF Sense. And there's been a lot of discussions over, not as much in the last couple months, but for a while, PFSense kind of picked up. We kind of go cyclical with PFSense mm-hmm. in our community, right? It gets real popular for a while, and then a bunch of people implement one. There's a bunch of questions. Everybody gets theirs running. And it really is a set it and forget it router. I, ha- I I rarely even look at mine anymore. Every once in a while, something gets slow. I'll pull up the the control panel and say, oh, what's, what's the band? Who's using the bandwidth, you know, kind of deal. Yeah. You know, I, I use, I actually keep a, you know, I'm crazy with tabs in Chrome. And I keep um, two tabs open all the time uh, for PFSense where I can just go over to it and look at it. Because I like knowing... Exactly how much bandwidth I'm using. Like I'm knowing tonight that you know, since I have HD video, I am pushing out oh, way. Uh, rub it in. Just rub it in. Okay. Yeah, but there's a reason for me to bring it up. <laughs> I'm my out bandwidth right now is more than double what it normally is. So I'm starting to wonder if this mm. HD out may cause some issues eventually. Oh. But I'm I'm pushing out you know two and a half meg right now, where normally I would be. You know, one to maybe even less. Um, if you look at yours right now, you well, you're streaming, so you'd be higher. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm a three in and two out. See, I'm pushing point. more out, and all I'm doing is hanging out with you. Okay. And and um, 
but I can see that. I can see live mm -hmm. statistics on what's going on, what's going out, what's going in. And, you know, I have two teenage boys, and if I see a lot going out, uh, I can, you know, P.O. Sense go and easily figure out who it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I know some people, uh, you know, when I first did this, people said, you're using a software firewall? And I said, all firewalls are software. <laughs> whether, you, whether you bought it from Best Buy or you made it yourself, it's software. Yeah, no, it's great. I love my yeah. My, my PF Sense, you know, I've, we've got that dashboard. We were talking pre-show about how long it's been running, and you hate to reboot this thing because you it's got the stats on the last time it was, you know, rebooted. And I think, in um, you know, mine, um, now we had a power outage uh, a couple weeks ago, so I'm at 22 days, 10 hours, 32 minutes of my router being up. But it's, wait, it's wait, gone. So you, what's that? Well, you had a power outage for how long? Oh, no, no, no. It was for, oh, I don't know, an hour maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah, so everything went down. I my the UPS ran out of ran out of juice, and uh, we lost everything at that point. But and and everything rebooted. But I've seen that 60, 70, 80 days. I think you had it in the hundreds, right? Oh yeah, I had it in the hundreds. Almost made it for a full year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, uh, right now I'm at 58 days. Yeah, pretty pretty cool to apply what Christian was talking about. You can apply this at home on their PF Sense router. It's it again. It's a little bit of an above average tech guy stuff, but it's very very doable and uh, lots of good information about a PF Sense router. Now, did you you wrote about the PF Sense router right in the yeah, Super so Router article? I did, and I intended for that to be a four part article. And I was <laughs> I don't want to get into it too deep, but I was going to do um, you know, I was talking about how I set this up on a, a VP uh, on a, a VM. Had it virtualized, had a PF Sense virtualized, and my I actually do what I call the super router, where I have PF Sense the router and sitting in front of that. You're reading the chat. Yeah, sitting I am reading the chat. <laughs> These <laughs> guys will not give up on my video. It's hilarious. <laughs> They're also teaching you: Do you not have a UPS sitting on your router? Which, if you're off for several hours, okay, that's a UPS is not going to make it that far. But hopefully you do yeah. have UPS sitting on your route. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, the UPS, I've got a pretty good UPS, um, that, but it's got the main PC and the broadcast server and the router all on it. And generally uh, we get these quick little surge, you know, down and up. 99% of our downtime is that. I have some software I could go into to tell me exactly when that outage happened and how long, it, you know, what time and how long it was for. But... Um, uh, yeah, well, it just it was longer. It was, I, and I don't know exactly. I, it was at least an hour, and my UPS is with everything running. Can't just with three PCs on them, just won't make it that long. Well, you distracted me with something. I want to go down now, if you don't mind, for a second. Go ahead. Talking about UPSs, you know, the the new power supplies won't work with the normal UPSs that you yeah. buy. So uh, I, the way I found that out is my home server, two of my servers, uh, which I had to replace the, the power supplies, kept going off every now and then, uh, and I was. You know, I was wondering what is going on. Why are these things? I got them both on their own individual UPSs, and everything else in the rack is running, but these two things keep stopping. And that's why I, I narrowed it down to it. They're using a new power supply, and it don't work with the the UPSs. So I went to Best to Micro Center this past weekend to get a power supply that would that they would work with. One that has a true sine wave. It took me forever to find one that actually said that because most of them don't say that. Some of them you can see is simulated sine wave, but it's very difficult to find where it's written. And all I could find was a plain cord cardboard box that uh, it had some other word to it that I f figured out that that is the right kind. So if you have a UPS and you and you're wondering why your system keeps shutting it off, even with the UPS on it, that's the problem. Yeah, simulated sine wave. We've had a lot of discussions again about six months ago. We yeah. kicked that around over in the forums, over the home server show. We spent a lot of time talking about that. Even here on this show, we talked about it. So, so it's given me now. I have a couple of UPSs that uh, have you know nothing, so nothing to do. So they are like my my U, my router has its own UPS just for it, so it can last quite a while because it, yeah. it's not much hardware. It doesn't have a, a monitor or anything, so it can last a while. But on the super router, I actually have Untangle, which is another thing like you can use these individually. It's like PFSense. You can use it individually, but I have it sitting in front of PFSense to do virus scanning as stuff comes in and out, and to do um, some, you know, what do you call it? web blocking, um, web, fil web filtering. Filtering, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So you have some old hardware sitting around. You know, give it a try. Give a PFSense or Untangle a try. Yeah, or even some new hardware that's super efficient. That that would be the best. You know, that you can get some new stuff. 
low powered CPU. I mean, I think right now my CPU is running at four <laughs> percent on that box. You know, I overpowered it. It's it's an Atom five twenty five and it's overpowered. And you know, um, one of your listeners emailed me when I was on last one. I talked about how we put Untangle in in front of our email server at work as handling millions of emails a month, and it is just running. It's Core i Core i five system. And it's probably i5 is overkill, even for the millions of emails that it's handling. Yeah. Um, and it's it's blocking spam very very nicely. We're blocking hundreds of thousands of spam, uh, you know, a month with that. Yeah. System. Yeah. And we've talked and we've said before, you know, hey, old equipment. Let me encourage you for power savings because this thing runs 24/7. Mm -hmm. Buy something you can get something really inexpensive, right now that's running the latest, especially you know some of the latest. Uh, stuff that's out there and and at least uh, go easy on the power and it just doesn't you know not much ram I, you know I also put an SSD in there cuz I had it it had a 30 gig SSD <laughs> so I threw that in there I was going to put a 30 gig SSD anywhere else in my systems anywhere so yeah. um, I did that it runs fine you know it just it just keeps humming along it's super quiet it just super quiet super cool it's been the best thing I've ever you done you don't need an SSD I I found a use for what am I going to do with these 100 gig drives yeah well there's a use for it yeah. That's 100 gig in a PF sense is that's even overkill. Yeah, but with an Atom 525 and and four gig of RAM and an SSD, the thing sips. I mean, it's a it's a handful of watts when yeah. when we plug it in and it's running. So it's a good way to do it. Well, guys, we have gone uh, we've gone a good distance here. I want to start coming in for a landing, Christian. I know there was a few more things you want to talk about. So let me let me quickly run through a few things. Uh, we're gonna save the uh, the Windows Server 2012 R2 Essentials. Uh, redo uh, for maybe the next show uh, we'll bring in. We'll talk a little bit more at length just to give folks an idea of what we're talking about. So uh, a couple weeks ago, um, Christian was uh, was on the show, and he was he was talking about this awesome ability now within Windows Server 2012 uh, Essentials to remote to actually connect, and I think you're, you have your PC connected there, right, to, your, to, the, yep. to the Essentials box back at home, and it's backing up, right? You don't have to be on... The land to make that work, right? It has remote backup capabilities. Right. Right. So and, you were and, and oh, to, quali ahead. to qualify that, that's over. So Microsoft kind of condensed their routing remote access so that for the average guy, it automatically sets up the VPN that puts you inside the network to do that. But uh, but I it's working. You're in. Yeah, you're in Maryland. You're backing up yeah. your PC yeah. to your. Essentially, your home server, which is a 2012 sure. Essentials box, right? Home. It works. You can do that. You don't have to be on the home network. That hasn't always worked easily or very well. It's working no. great for you. So you yep. talked about that, and we just blew it off. Yep. <laughs> we were like, okay, Christian. And I actually, if you go back to the last podcast, I actually apologize. And Christian and I had that conversation. I'm like, dude, I had, I, you know, and I caught it because I was listening to the podcast to write the show notes, and I'm like, unbelievable. He had this whole, <laughs> and I was chatting with the folks. You know, I was in chat trying to. We were talking about why the high bandwidth and low bandwidth was working and why it wasn't. It's one of those things when you multi multitask during a podcast, you're going to miss in the conversation. So a total miss on my part. So the very next week, Zadler is on the show. And John, so I, I bring that up, and John's like, oh, yeah, 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 we got some things. And so I think you and Zadler, Christian, were talking behind the scenes as well because he referenced a moment when he talked to you, are you sure it can do this? And you said, Absolutely. And uh, and so there's some there's some capabilities that we didn't highlight very well, um, but I think just to make a long story short, you can now be anywhere, and and of course that first backup is going to be big. I think this was the the lesson that we talked about last week. The very first backup is going to be pretty big, and if you have bandwidth caps, that may not be great. Um, for well, yeah, that, right? it, the ideal scenario is if you can get the first backup in at home and then take the device off site to connect, then that that's like your best deal. Yeah, that's so how I did it. Take it to your home network, back it up one time, pick it off, take it where you're going. Do the rest yeah. of the backups remotely. Because the, it, the, inc the incremental backups don't take that long over the Maryland network yeah. at all. No, well, yeah, you're, you're in a pretty good boat there. But still, for the average user, that would work out pretty well. So they've made that that and the connector install a lot easier in the, in the 2012 uh, R2 Essentials. Or in Essentials, because you're not on R2 yet. You're still just on Essentials, right? No. Yeah. So but it'll good, be there in R2. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. So some good stuff when we talk about Windows Home Server stuff. Uh, some good stuff there, Christian. Sorry, I wasn't listening. <laughs> I can't. I, all right. I don't always miss whole conversations, but I miss that one completely. 
So good stuff there. Um, so just to come around on that, and then any other little, any other small stuff, any housekeeping, Christian, you need to clean up. Oh, I just want to make this the. Can I digress? Bios talk for like two yeah. minutes. Yeah, I'll do so do, quick. One, do one. Go. All right. My my super fast one is before I left for College Park, I um, took a Nettle three box, and okay, by Nettle three box, I mean an HP computer that used to have a Phenom one CPU in it that used to only support Phenom 1 CPUs, and it was a Nettle 3 HP board that used to run the famous chipset of its time, the MCP61 chipset, which was, like, a super big fan. I was in, like, everything at, at, at certain points, laptops and desktops. I mean, HP, Dell, Acer, I mean, everything had an MCP61 and Enforce 430 in it uh, in the probably 2008, 2009 time frame, right? Um, and so we had a, when our media center, which I don't even think I talked about this, but our media center was the only thing on our network that didn't have a surge protector and zap there went the, the motherboard and CPU or went the motherboard, the CPU on it was a Phenom two, one of the low 65 watt Phenom twos. Um, and so I, I mean, obviously we scrapped the board for the Haswell. Oh yeah. I did tell you guys about that cause I told you about building the Haswell replacement, but I took that Phenom 2 CPU and I stuck it in this Nettle 3 lab uh, motherboard that's only supposed to support Phenom 1. Um, and then I did a world-class BIOS-mods.com uh, BIOS update by taking a retail BIOS for a BIOSTAR motherboard and flashing it onto this HP OEM board. And it detects and runs the 65-watt Phenom 2 perfect. And uh, it's sitting in my dorm room running all my apps. And it's just a, it's a fantastic box to throw around for college that I don't have to worry nice. about. And my flamethrower can stay at home comfortably. That is a hack right there, my friend. Yep. Nice job. Making very use cool. of the resources. Yeah. No, it's very cool. That's one of the advantages of, uh, of being the guy out there at bios-mods.com. You got it. Yeah. Rock on. Mike, anything anything uh, you want to wrap with? Um, no, no, I think I'm good. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks for coming out and. and I can always do in. some photography stuff out there, but I think we we did good tonight. Yeah, no, it's a good good show. Christian did some good stuff. I uh, uh, just before showtime, Andrew said I'm not going to be able to make it, and it's always for me. It's always nice to have a second. Uh, you know, to have three of at least three of us. It could be mm -hmm. Christian and I, but those those aren't my favorite podcasts. It's more fun when it's three. And uh, so I, I pinged you, and of course you're always great to just jump in at the last minute. So I appreciate your. Uh, it looks like the hair's growing out, by the way. You're getting that uh, started. It is. Out. If I turn just a little too much, you can see. I can, I've noticed a few times because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on with you guys, but over to my right is where uh, the, I'm watching the show live and watching chat. And if I turn a little too much, I, you can see a little bit. But it, you know, yeah. it's the only thing that's weird about the hair being this short is if I run a comb through it, it just won't do anything. Yeah, I run a comb through it. It's right back where it started when I so combing it is worthless. You've got to uh, you got a couple more weeks before you can comb that. At least I, I was going back and looking at some old podcasts, and I, you know how it's so funny. You can you you see people as they are today, and I don't like I do, but I don't remember you with longer hair. You know, at this point, <laughs> we've been looking at you so long, and I was like. Wow, his hair was really long. <laughs> it was longer, right? Longer, yeah. yeah. I, so uh, you, we'll see what I look like at the when I come to the home service show. I may still have to wear one of these uh, little, not little just blue yarmulke. one. My wife bought me a blue and a black one. I don't yarmulke. It's not a yarmulke. <laughs> <laughs> a, black, a, a black and a blue one, and I do not like the blue one. So I'm sure I'll, pay, I'll have the the black one. All right. Well, good good stuff. Well, I think you're the spot. I don't think does, anybody's. That's the phrase. Does the phrase full fauché apply here? <laughs> <laughs> it, might. it might. Oh, it might. Christian, speaking of the full fauché, he sent me Directed. an email, and he he is challenging your Haswell uh, um, uh, experience. So please. we might have to do a fauché Johnson smackdown. It's sort of like the uh, Zoolander with the um, the dance. What did We're they do? Have a the, dance the, off. It wasn't a dance off. It was a what they oh, do? Dance fight. It was a dance fight. Yeah. Yeah. They can, they, the title they can, of next you know, week's podcast is going to be the the Haswell dance, dance off. The yeah. Haswell dance fight. The yeah. two of you are going to we're going to. So I'm going to put the two of you together. He's at. I mean, he is absolutely, and he listens to the show. He 
he said he sent me an email. He said he about fell out. He was driving and he about <laughs> drove off the road <laughs> or something like that when he heard you talking about uh, about your Haswell experience. That was he fought it. It was not easy. And I mean, I even asked you. I'm like, are you sure it was that easy for you? And you're like, oh yeah, a piece of cake. It was great. So sleeped perfect. I popped, you know, we popped it in, put it in the box. It's fast. It it goes from a sleep state to pulling live TV in maybe about two and a half seconds from when you uh, you you hit the power button on your media center remote and it's just there. And yeah. like I said, the OS setup and everything was, yeah. was quick and yeah. it's so, on the domain and it's 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 low power, high speed, high performance. And if you want the benchmarks, I send you the benchmarks. Not his experience, and uh, so he's uh, he wants to do a dance fight. Well, yeah, I think so now I gotta go watch Zoolander. Like oh, Zoolander is great. <laughs> oh yeah. no, I've seen it before. That's why I had the reference. But now that we've and uh, Jam Three Ohio out there says, yeah, Jim McCarthy's you know, out there. Yeah, that Zoolander rules. Now I need to go watch it again. <laughs> that is one of those movies I think gets funnier as it gets older. You know, the first the, time, yes, the first time I watched yeah. it, I thought oh, that's stupid. <laughs> yeah, but I like, you know, I like the two main stars in it. And I went back and watched it again and said, why do I think this is stupid? This movie is awesome. Yeah. yeah it gets better. <laughs> it's it's one of those that just kind of grows on you. So yeah. it's a good nerd movie. So um, so we'll we'll get that put together. Um, Mike even offered to come on the show. And so we'll uh, we'll, we'll get it done and, uh, and talk through Haswell. So good stuff. Um, I'm sure Christian will hold his own. This will be this will be awesome. Can't wait yeah. to get that done. I'll... Um, uh, just a few short notes on my on my side. It's actually in my pocket. I got a brand new Lumia 520 that came in the that came to me from Amazon uh, yesterday. What's today? Thursday? Yeah. So it came to me yesterday in in there and running Windows Phone 8 and uh, has been a dynamite. This is 99 bucks, no contract. Okay. So if you're thinking about like, hey, I want to do a Windows Phone, but I'm currently tied into Android and and I, you know, I don't want to go on a contract. Okay, 99 bucks, no contract. I literally bought this on Amazon, shipped it to me. Uh, I'm a Prime member, thanks to Mike Howard. I'm a Prime member. And uh, shipped it to me for free, came the next day or two days later, whatever, and uh, pulled it out of the box, fired up the phone, no no contract, no nothing, everything except the Here apps, the, the Nokia Here. So that's like um, Drive and some of the Maps stuff. They won't work without the SIM card, right? So, but everything else works, right? All the other apps work. Of course, um, I don't, I can't get phone calls on it, and I can't get text messages because I don't have a phone number at this point. But mm -hmm. through the SIM card in, fired it back up, all the rest of the apps work. And uh, the beauty of the, and I've talked about this a million times before, the beauty of the Lumia software is that you don't need an internet, you don't need a live connection to make everything work. So if you're in your car and you're driving, the GPS and the nav stuff works. You can download the maps in advance, but all that stuff works just great. So been a great little Windows phone for a hundred bucks. I'm in business. I don't. I'm never going to make a phone call on this thing. I'm just going to continue to use it like a media player, and it kind of gets me into the into the Microsoft space. And now I can nice. go on Surface Geeks and talk about this this piece. I like it. Ninety-nine bucks. Yeah, smart, it looks good. Smart, smart little phone, you know. Looks good. And uh, and so pretty cool. That just came in. I'll be talking about that over the next couple of weeks. And um, had a little chat with uh, actually so Mary Jo Foley a little bit on uh, Twitter about mm -hmm. that. And then this morning, Paul, I was going back and forth a little, a little bit, a couple of tweets with Paul Throt. Oh, very so, nice. Yeah, it was it was uh, Brian, you know, Brian Mystic Geek, right? Uh -huh. Uh, Brian Burgess was uh, he and I were talking because he just bought one too and has been he has been blogging about it and uh, same deal. I think they're going to sell at ninety nine bucks. I think they're going to sell a crap load of these things. Well, you know what what they've needed to do and they're starting to do it now is they need something to separate themselves. And that the the thing with the uh, the Lumia that can was forty one megapixel camera. That is that separates themselves from everybody else, and now people it makes people look at it. So if you don't have something, that, people are kind of locked into Android or, or iPhone. To get them to, you know, stop their gaze at one of those two phones, you got to do something to get people to look your way. And I think that the the 41 megapixel that's a good um, thing to do. It gets people to look your way. Um, and if you have a cheaper, good phone like that, it gets people to look your way. Because yeah. if if you're not, when you walk in there to get pick up a phone. 
you're going in, I want an iPhone or I want an Android phone. There's got to be some compelling reason for you to even look over at the, the Windows phone. And once you do, now you can make an informed decision of which one you want to buy. Yeah. And, and, and maybe once they, once they can get people looking at their stuff, you'll start to see some of the market share numbers come up. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. Speaking I, of things I, we got, yeah. so in the last week, two weeks, I've had three hard drives die. Oh, one, of them was a, one of them was a Caviar Black 1.5 terabyte and two Seagate 1.5 terabyte drives. So today I got four two terabyte uh, uh, reds come in the mail. And I just got an email that my Chromecast is arriving September 10th, so five days. Oh, it's it's on its way. Yeah. yeah, it's on its way. You won't. I don't. I'll predict you won't be super impressed with it at the start. Just as a few things, but there's new stuff coming for it. So, yeah. it's um, uh, pretty cool. Um, yeah. So, oh, and then um, I've been doing so today, all day today, and all day tomorrow. I've been at the Heartland Developer Conference here in Omaha. We're doing some live podcasting. So, if you're listening live tomorrow, if you got some time during work, put us on slash live Put us on. I'll be doing about eight interviews, all tech guys, all enterprise tech stuff. Although today I did an interview with a guy. We ended up talking for 20 minutes about Lumia, uh, Nokia, Lumia phones. He had the 1020, so I got a chance to see the, 10, the 1020 in the wild and kind of look at it. That thing is light and slick and a big camera on the front of it. And, man, I tell you what, I'm liking, I'm liking what I'm seeing from Nokia and the Lumia line. I, I've said this before. If a Lumia was on Sprint, I would not have the GS4. Yeah. So it, it's... Um, I just like and and having a Windows 8 phone or Windows Phone 8 at this point, I'm liking it, liking it a lot. It's a it's a nice well, change from Android. I think the fact that Microsoft bought um, or whatever that deal is trying know, to buy. I don't know yeah. if it's a true buy or whatever, but it sounds like it is. So I haven't looked into the deal. So if I said it wrong, I, I I'm sorry. Yeah. But you know they're at least making a huge investment, if not right, or buying Nokia, shows that they're committed to the Windows Phone and they're not they're not giving up. Um, you know, you can see BlackBerry looks more like they're giving up. And right now, BlackBerry still has a larger market share than, than Microsoft. So that tells you something. That BlackBerry sees the future is is nothing but down. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And 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 no no amount of effort to change that nothing but down. Where where Microsoft is saying we're still committed to this, and the BlackBerry going down may actually help them pick up market share. I think so. I think a lot and, of BlackBerry users would probably come over. And so. I think it, it, whether you're a fan of iPhone or, or Android phone or whatever, um, you know, having a third competitor, a third, you know, strong competitor is nothing but good for consumers. Yeah, no, I I like it. We need three yeah. strong ones, and Microsoft's got the dollars. Obviously, kicking out seven billion dollars for a Nokia acquisition. Yeah, they've got some money. And you know what? <laughs> this is how crazy this is. Okay, they're buying them for seven billion all European money. So this isn't. They haven't even. Is that real money though? That's it's real like, money. That's monopoly no. stuff, right? Well, no, it's that's yeah, it's real stuff. Real. Well, it's European. It's well, euros. Well, they put that <laughs> funny symbol on it. I thought that was like <laughs> they do monopoly. And I could when I was in Germany and I had a bunch of euros in my hand. It is really hard to tell what is what when you've never seen a euro before. Yeah. So it took it took me a while to figure out their money. But seven, I think seven billion. It's all coming from the European division. That means they've they're, they're not even touching the money they have here in the United States. So yeah. it's like, good God, they got money. Um, so interesting. And then uh, one last thing uh, I mentioned early in the show, we got the Tech Scholarship Fund up and running. And so if you are an aspiring review artist, uh, someone who likes to either write or come on the show and talk about some kind of tech gadget, this 520 would be something. Although I've got one already, but this like this, you know, less than a hundred bucks some kind of consumer gadget that I can buy on Amazon, something that uh, I can ship to you here in the United States. It gets difficult outside the U.S. for me to do that. But if uh, you, you've got something in mind, let me know. Podcast at TheAverageGuy.tv and let me know what you would like to do. And I'd love to talk with you about it. Maybe we can get it in your hands. You review it. You talk about it. You get to keep it. And uh, it's just like that. I am I am done with trying to get reviews and get stuff out of companies. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm gonna, if I'm going to if I'm going to review it, if I'm going to talk about it, I'm going to buy it. And uh, I just Leo has moved to that model, and I just I like it. I I, I hate begging companies for stuff. Um, although speaking of that, we've got a whole bunch of stuff we're giving away at the meetup. You're going to want to be there if you're anywhere near Indianapolis on on uh, September 21st. You want to be at the meetup. I think everybody's going to walk away with something, Mike. I mean, I can't except me and Dave. 
But I think I already know what I want. I think every everybody's gonna walk away with something for sure. Isn't there some kind of um? What's the big item? What's the big item? Synology. Yeah. Yeah. There's a Synology five four fifteen or something like that. So um, that they're giving. I brought away. my. I'm bringing my truck so we can load it up in there. Load it up and take it back. It's gonna be a good time by all. Well, Christian, thanks for taking a few moments out of your schedule. I know life's crazy for you. You don't even look frazzled, dude. You've been in. You've been in college for a week. Don't even look frazzled. Nah, it's 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 not as bad as everyone makes it out to be. <laughs> okay, that's what I expect from you, Christian. <laughs> yeah, it's it's okay. It's only my freshman year of college. Most students. we move, we adapt. It's, it's the evolutionary yeah. cycle. I like it. I like it, Mike. Thanks for yeah, again, no thanks for coming in on short notice. We are out here every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Central. Even though I told uh, Tim Black it was 8 p.m. Eastern earlier today on Twitter, <laughs> it is 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern. And uh, don't forget to join us an hour early on Groove Shark if you go out to theaverageguy.tv slash music. We'll be messing around with that. I'm not sure we'll do that long term, but let's try it out for a couple shows and see how it works. So far, the reviews have been good. Everybody that's jumped in there has said, hey, this is kind of cool. Mike, it needs to run on a portrait or a yeah, portrait monitor. And I have that on one of my monitors. Yeah, it's, great. That, it's great on that monitor. It is. It runs long ways. And mm-hmm. so I'm going to have to spin one of my monitors around if we're going to do it long term or Maybe get another one that I turn. Yeah, I have four monitors here, and I have three of them in normal landscape mode, and the one in portrait mode. And I, I've often thought, should I flip it back? But there's always something I'm saying, no, I'm glad I got that one that way. Yeah, Groove Shark is one of those sites that yeah. looks better along, you know, like your social media, right? Like Skype, like Twitter, like all that stuff that runs long ways. That yeah, works good. So, guys, thanks for coming out tonight. We'll do it again next week, next Thursday out at theaverageguy.tv slash live. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.